Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Paul Johnson, The Last Nighters, and you can find us on the Launchpad Media where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. You can also find us at lastnighters.com slash 127 for this episode on Saving Private Ryan. It is going to be the 76th anniversary of the D-Day invasion of Normandy, and we wanted to talk uh, from a historical context about this movie with uh, you know some level of accuracy and perhaps try to dispel some of the myths about World War II being one of the good wars. Um, so we will uh, get into that. Uh, very shortly here with our special guest, Prof. CJ of the Dangerous History Podcast. Uh, a little bit about CJ. He's been teaching college history since 2006, but uh, apparently he's been a smart ass and an iconoclast and a cynical questioner and critic of authority since he was a kid. Naturally, these attitudes have influenced his take on history, which probably makes his podcast, the Dangerous History Podcast, so much fun. So, uh, Prof. CJ, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, maybe elaborating a little bit on what you do and where people can find your work. Yeah, sure thing. So um, as you said, I have uh, history degrees and I've been teaching college history for a while. And then back in 2014, after thinking about it for a while, I finally uh, started a podcast and it's my take on history, which my perspective is kind of uh, my big influence is would be uh, Murray Rothbard, George Carlin, Lysander Spooner, John Carpenter, and a few others. But, you know, in general, just kind of uh, skeptical and hostile towards authority, individualist, anarchist perspective, all that kind of stuff. So not the version of history you're going to get in most places. And, um, you know, I cover a variety of stuff. I've done more American history than anything else, just because most of my listeners are Americans and that's what they want. But, uh, yeah, I've covered a lot of different topics. So if you go to dangeroushistorypodcast.com, you'll get to my homepage and it's on all the usual podcast venues. Uh, right now, I'm in the midst of a Woodrow Wilson ongoing mini series that'll probably take at least another year or two for me to get all the way through, um, going through his uh, horrific life and career with a fine tooth comb. And I've got some other interesting stuff in the works for the relatively near future, like. Uh, probably going to do something on the 1918 Spanish quote unquote influenza epidemic in the relatively near future. Although as you were alluding to in your um, intro segment, apparently the pandemic's done. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, I didn't get my research done quick enough to, to cover the influenza epidemic, but maybe there'll be another pandemic by the time I get that up. So. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, that's what I fear is that the uh, response to this one will give them ideas on what to do next time, harder and faster and sooner and more aggressively to try to deal with future uh, pandemics or even, um, I guess, it's not it's not a cry wolf thing, but it didn't turn out as bad as they thought, uh, I think, so. Yeah, yeah, it's not completely nothing, but, and I can understand that, you know, this was a new disease and I can understand initially being, a little bit on the to airing on the side of caution and all that, but it's just a classic case of, you know, any big dumb bureaucratic organization, but especially if it has a monopoly on, on force is going to be super slow to adapt to changing circumstances and new evidence and whatever. And, you know, I mean, I, I guess the one nice thing you could say about the U S is there's still some elements of federalism and decentralization. So at least, you know, the entire, a uh, country isn't being locked down like New York and California and what have you, but you know, it, they clearly, they clearly um, overreacted, which again, I, I would cut them a little slack, but to not undo it once you realize that it's not what you thought it was, it just shows, you know, there's all kinds of mission creep stuff going on. There's all kinds of public choice, economic stuff going on, um, all kinds of rent seeking going on. So yeah, yeah but it's all over. Now that yeah. we're in, uh, now, now that they're, you know, turning the riots in the streets and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. 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 They certainly seem to have uh, forgotten it rather quickly, even though everyone's kind of been under house arrest for a couple of months here. Um, but uh, the list of people who are your influences, that's almost like my answer for who would you have at a, you know, a dinner if you could if, from anyone in any time of history. And uh, yeah, most of those names are definitely uh, up on that list for me. 
So yeah, yeah, it and and I think that's a, another thing that separates me. You know, aside from the fact that obviously most historians run the ideological spectrum from sort of like center left, typical Democratic Party hacks out to mostly like out to Bernie Sanders and the occasional outright Marxist. But um, aside from that, it's it's just I I, I just I think have a, have a bad attitude. In, in a way that comes from people like George Carlin and uh, in the movies of John Carpenter, you know, they live and uh, snake Plissken, all these sorts of characters. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just, I kind of, I, I just mentally always have a middle finger towards <laughs> all the establishment institutions as just my default setting. So. But you're, you're among friends here then <laughs> for sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Well, very good. Well, uh, and people can also find uh, how I usually find your stuff is at profcj.org. Yep, um, so that'll that work also too. Goes there. Okay, all to the same spot. Yep. All right. Very good. Well, again, thank you uh, for joining us. And uh, we usually start off with the Google description, which I'll give a read to now. And then I'll go to Robert for his open because uh, I keep throwing him off with uh, trying to, you know, juke you or something, Robert. All right, so Saving Private Ryan came out in 1998, rated R. It's a war slash drama film, two hours and 50 minutes by Steven Spielberg. And it uh, got an 8.6 IMDb, 93% Rotten Tomatoes, and 95% of Google users like it. The description reads, Captain John Miller, played by Tom Hanks, takes his men behind enemy lines to find Private James Ryan, whose three brothers have been killed in combat, surrounded by the brutal realities of war, while searching for Ryan, each man embarks upon a personal journey and discovers their own strength to triumph over an uncertain future with honor, decency, and courage. Came out July 24th, 1998. Director was Spielberg, and a budget of $70 million. It won several Academy Awards. But in a shocker, it lost uh, Best Picture to Shakespeare in Love. So, uh, Robert, let's go to you for your take uh, on the description and your opening salvo. Well, this is a very simplistic plot of a movie for, um, what did you say it was? Two hours and 40 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that? It says two hours and 50, but it, yeah. 250, yeah. Pretty long. It's really long. Mm -hmm. And there's very little that actually happens. It's the story of this band of guys that go find another guy. And it shows that you really don't need a high concept for a movie to have a fairly engaging film. You, and you have this, um, you get this basically simple setup, and then you just have them doing this very basic thing, but you tell it in an interesting way, and it's set in an interesting time, and you have very naturalistic, like, not, you know, forced dialogue. They're basically just talking about things that they would normally be talking about in that situation. It felt very natural. Um, you know, they're just humans. It's a human, it's a good human story. Um, you know, I, it's not a perfect movie. I've got a few issues, but overall, um, yeah, it's really, really strong. Um, the, the two hours and 50 minutes go by pretty quick because it's not inundating you with, I don't know, high concepts or different plot points and different, you know, it's not like have different multiple plot threads that all come together at the end. It's really just a single plot thread that goes all the way through. Um, this is one of, I think, Spielberg's last really good movies. But uh, yeah, let's get into it. All right, very good. Well, I think that there are, were actually some pretty interesting uh, elements to this just from a morality perspective. And they actually try to tackle the, hey, we're going to trade the lives of potentially eight guys for this one guy. And they sort of move back and forth with that. And, and I, even Miller, played by Hanks, kind of uh, gets a bit converted once he starts talking to some people who are who are like um you know if if it's the last one it's more important or you know it's like almost a margin of utility scale though you, it's really hard to apply that to people in human lives but uh, it's almost like the angle they went with there um, because the mother the family was down to their their one last son versus you know and everyone who is quote unquote sacrificing their sons who are going off to war uh, over in europe but um, anyway, I'll go over to uh, CJ for your um, take on just the basic general information, uh, any opening and any response to what we've said so far. Yeah, well, I, I would agree. It's a, it's a very well-made movie. 
It's very well done. Um, most of the historical accuracy, just as far as like how things looked, um, the some of the tactics and weapons and all that, you know, the film is notorious for the opening, whatever it is, 20, 30 minutes depicting the Omaha Beach landing. Uh, supposedly, even according to veterans who were there, they mostly nailed that. There were a few minor things that were depicted inaccurately just, you know, for the purpose of making the movie look cool, but not, not a whole lot. So just from a standpoint of accurately depicting that operation, it's pretty spot on. It is, as you're saying, it's just well done, well directed. And of course, as with so many Spielberg movies, it's got an excellent John Williams soundtrack that perfectly uh, meshes with the mood of, of the movie at various points. So, you know, from, from all the like filmmaker craft uh, perspective, it's, it's a very well-made movie and I can remember when it came out and then Shakespeare in love beating it for the Oscar for best picture. I can remember teenage me just WTF, you know, like this, that was, that was the beginning of, of me realizing not that I had ever really been like one of these big, you know, Oscar and awards type of people, but just me looking at that going like this, this makes no sense. You know, what, what's going on? It's just like the most recent one. They didn't give it to uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You know, they gave it to um, Parasite. Parasite, which was, mm-hmm. you know, it was an interesting movie, but I didn't think that deserved the Oscar for Best Picture of last year. But anyway, a little, little sidetracked. Yeah, the, the film brings up these interesting questions about how you do this calculus with human lives, which war is just the ultimate extreme example of this. And you could apply this to a lot of different aspects of war. You could apply it to all kinds of questions like, well, were the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki justified? Well, did they actually save lives on net? And if so, does that make them justified? Did they even save lives on net? Were they actually necessary? And all these sorts of questions, which you can, you know, debate endlessly. And the film, I feel like it raises those issues but it doesn't really end up in any kind of a, a satisfying conclusion with them. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm not sure how else to say that other than it, it doesn't really solve the issue. It kind of papers over it in a way at the end. And there, I think there's a way you can raise moral questions in a film or a book or whatever and not resolve them neat and clean because a lot of times that's how real life is. But I felt like the film didn't quite even do that in a way that was satisfying in its unsatisfyingness. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of get what you're saying. Like it Spielberg's so accomplished and so um, good at his craft that it almost comes out vanilla in how he's resolving this. Cause you're like, you're looking for something more or that ambiguous ending where it's left in the interpretation of the viewer which I kind of like that. Uh, we've had a couple of movies recently where it's kind of like really open to interpretation and su- people's subjective experience bringing to it. Like Apocalypse Now was one we did uh, just a few weeks ago. And you can take that so many di- different ways. And uh, I, I actually really enjoy that kind of stuff because then it, it's up to, you know, it's, it's an art, you know, and, and it's an art appreciation. Uh, but with this, it feels like there's not so much art, there's more technical ability. Mm-hmm. There's more technical craft on display here. And it's well done, it's well polished, and there's some trickery involved. Um, One of the things I really noticed was uh, just with the cinematography and and how Spielberg frames the shot from the old man and his face zooming in, and then you zoom into Tom Hanks, John Miller on on the landing craft, and you're led to believe these are the same people. So you're led to believe that John Miller is gonna survive this entire thing and become an old man. And it's a bit of a throw you off um, kind of thing. And I appreciate that. And I think it's well done. But um, that's the level of kind of craft and and depth that he's working with. So it's not like deeper levels of uh, consideration or or, or moral questions here. And and I guess another thing that I kind of think uh, was a bit unsatisfying was we're shown 
these American soldiers as supposedly the good guys in the good war and the nameless, faceless uh, Germans shooting at them from these nests. And we get to know some of the Germans a little bit, but they betray uh, by being released, you know, and, and it ends up almost being this lesson at the end, like, oh, we should have murdered that guy. We should have committed that war crime because he came back and bit us in the ass. And that to me was a little bit um, surprising from the ET guy to come back and kind of have that sort of message at the end. Cause I would have figured he would have been more along the lines of, yeah, you want to do the right thing and then have the right result. So, you know, in a way he showed something that was probably more realistic, but also I question why he would presented it. Like what message is he telling us? Uh, what, what do you think, Robert? Oh, hold on. I got to unmute you. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, I can't really say why he would want to do that. You're right. It, it, it leaves it kind of tosses his uh, moral moralizing up in the air and that it actually comes back and bites you. Um, I also wanted to talk about we're talking about this. Um, these characters and how they're questioning this mission that they're put on, like, what's the point of this mission? We're we're risking eight lives to save one. And I guess their mission there in the war is to get to Berlin and win the war. And they don't really see how this helps them do that. But, I mean, they're risking their lives anyway, and I guess they're okay with that. And then at one point, mm -hmm. at one point they have a chance to take out, like, this machine gun nest. And, like, one of them's like, or a couple of them are like, no, we don't want to do this. But Hanks is like, yeah, we're actually here to win the war, right? This is what we're here to do. Uh, I guess I'm not really sure where I'm going with this, but um, well, I I had an issue with that whole decision where uh, Tom Hanks's character says, "All right, we got to take out this machine gun nest," even though they could have very easily gone around it, because that that it just seemed wildly out of character for him, based on everything that he had said and did uh, said and done since getting that mission. He, he had been very focused on, all right, my orders are to save private Ryan. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to do it because those are my orders and I'm a good soldier. And because it'll help me, they apparently are under the impression that if they successfully complete this mission, they'll go home early too. It sounds like based on some of the things they say. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I really had, uh, I felt like that was a plot contrivance, him all of a sudden being like, no, we have to take out this uh, machine gun nest in the middle of nowhere that isn't part of our job. I felt like that was just sort of artificially put into the plot so that um, so that Rabisi's character, the medic, would get killed, and so that then you would have the moral dilemma of the prisoner and mm -hmm. what to do. And the tension and with the Brooklyn guy. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. You'd have the, the conflict there and uh, Tom Sizemore, the sergeant, then, you know, threatening to shoot him and and all that. And and so, yeah, that, that whole scenario, I mean, I think it played out naturally once it got going, but I just had an issue with the whole beginning of that scenario. It just seemed like that, that wouldn't have been something that uh, Tom Hanks would have done based on what we've seen him say and do so far. And it, it is kind of interesting how the film, and I understand, as you were sort of saying, that, you know, soldiers may very well feel this way in the heat and immediate aftermath of battle. But there is this issue where, from the perspective of those German soldiers who are most likely conscripts, and even if they are true believers in their, you know, in the Nazi ideology or whatever, you know, they, they may very well have been raised in the Hitler youth and all that. And so, you know, they're, they're in, they may be fighting for a terrible cause, but from their immediate perspective, they're just the other side's soldiers, right? They're just the other side's grunts also following orders and obeying, you know, their leaders and their propaganda and all that. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying that they're not worse because of who and what they're serving, but, you know, the idea that, when that machine gun nest shot the guy who was charging at them to kill them, those machine gunners were somehow doing something like above and beyond, you know, bad. Right. Whereas mm -hmm. like 
you were charging at them to kill them when they shot one of your guys. Th- it does seem kind of weird to then portray it as like, see, look how bad they killed one of our guys. When it's like, right. It, it, what it, outrage. <laughs> it, yeah. It was a, it was a two way firefight there. You we know? didn't expect this to happen. Yeah. And, and I can understand in the sense of realism, right. That a soldier who just saw his buddy get killed may very well have that visceral reaction. Uh, and and want to kill the other guys. Even I'm not saying that that it's unrealistic. I'm saying it does. I I feel like Spielberg and probably the other uh, you know top people involved in the production of this thing. I feel like they were conflicted because as far as I know, you know Spielberg's a boomer. He didn't go to Vietnam. As far as I know, although I don't think he's ever made a Vietnam War movie. As far as I know, he is not a fan of the Vietnam War. As far as I know, he's at least somewhat anti-war of a lot of recent wars. And yet he still is all in on, you know, the World War II as the good war narrative and the greatest generation and all that stuff. And so I think that's that's where a lot of the the feeling of, of tension and, and internal contradiction in the movie may be coming from. Because on the one hand, they're like, Look how brutal war is. Look how ugly and gory and chaotic it is and how, how dehumanizing it is and all this sort of thing. Oh, but the, this is the one good war and these guys are the greatest generation and the other side's pure evil and nothing. Like, they, 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 that's why the movie has this feeling to me of being sort of, I don't know, a little, a little bit kind of neither fish nor fowl. It can't quite decide whether, whether it's critiquing war by showing it honestly or whether, you know, it, it'll quickly tack back to, but we're the pure good guys. They're the pure bad guys. And it's very simple. So, yeah. Now there was that moral question that does end up biting them in the ass. And then uh, what's it? Oppum is the guy who failed to save uh, Mellish. And then he grows a set and then shoots the, the guy that they had released after he shot Miller. So it's like a little bit too late there, buddy. But um, we saw that, similar thing during the invasion of the beach, the storming of the beach, where they use the flamethrowers on the machine gun nest or in the, in the barracks or uh, whatever that fortification is called. And they're like, don't shoot, don't shoot, let them burn. You know, and these are the good guys saying that. And that's like, yeah, that's some dark evil shit, you know, like let's have them suffer. Let's let them live two minutes longer in pure agonizing pain versus shooting them and putting them out of their pain. Um, so I think you're right. There are some conflicting messages here. And uh, another thing that was kind of weird was during the invasion, um, when they're shooting into the water and the soldiers are getting shot in the water, like deep under the water, like a couple of feet deep. Uh, according to Mythbusters, that's not possible. Yeah, um, no, there's way too much friction on those bullets. They're not going to penetrate. Yeah, I saw him shoot a 50 cal into a swimming pool and it only penetrated like maybe a foot, foot and a half before it slowed down to a non-lethal velocity. So I'll try to find that clip, but yeah, apparently you can't shoot uh, that deep into the water and kill people. So, But it looked cool, right? It did look cool. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely look cool. Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had, yeah. A, I had oh, oh, go ahead, CJ. I was, I was just going to say on, on uh, Upham's character arc there, and he, he's, in some ways the only character who really has some sort of arc and you know, he's this, he's this nerdy cowardly guy. And then he's the main one defending shooting the German prisoner initially and kind of convinces Tom Hanks to, to let the guy go. And then as you said, is he doesn't save his buddy, but then he shoots the German after the fact when he's trying to surrender again. And I felt like the Upham arc that starts off as, as this, this weak, nerdy, cowardly guy. And then at the end, he's shooting a man in cold blood who's surrendered that, that, that arc to me is very, you can take it either way. You could, and again, the tension of this movie on this, where you could look at it and go, God, how horrible is war that eventually even this very, you know, kind of harmless, sort of a guy is is ultimately brutalized enough by the experience that, that he's he's able to shoot a man in cold blood or you could take it and go he finally manned up and figured out what you need to do he finally figured out that you need to kill these people and 
you know, it, and it's like a wonderful triumphant arc that he finally manned up to the situation. And, and I think it's one of the things that you run into with almost every war movie is the potential that anyone can Rorschach an anti-war or a pro-war message onto almost any war movie. And I think this is a good example of that. Yeah, I agree. And I think yeah. I heard you mention that on your uh, show with the Mises caucus guys. Um, and, and I actually took a note on that. Let me see what I wrote here. Um, let's see. Yeah, so in, in the Mises Caucus, but I'll, I'll have a link to it on the show notes page, of course. Uh, you had mentioned that there was a lot of realism in the trench warfare in the movie 1917. Uh, what did you make of the realism of the Saving Private Ryan D-Day? As far as I can tell, it's mostly very realistic. And this is one of a handful of, of war movies about modern war that I would say does a great job on just getting that experientialness of it, the, the feel, the chaos, the noise, the blood and guts, the, the fact that it, it's just a bloody mess and it, and it often gets very chaotic very quickly. I mean, there's all those little moments, even just in the opening invasion scene where, you know, there's the one guy that a bullet dings off his helmet and he goes, wow, he pulls up his helmet and looks at the dent. It's like, man, how lucky I am. And then a split second later, he catches one right through the brain. Yeah. And, you know, there's the guy who's had his arm blown off and he kind of grabs his arm and he's just kind of like holding it and, and sort of staggering around. And there's all those little moments like that or when uh, the medic is finally succeeding in patching someone up and then the person he's working on catches a stray bullet and just all that work was for nothing. You know, yeah. all, all those those dark, chaotic moments that happen in war. And so this movie does pretty good on a lot of that stuff. It's just then it comes it'll come through periodically with the, with the kind of pro war team America kind of stuff. 1917 didn't have that grafted onto it. And um, you know, there's, there's a few others, as far as I know, Black Hawk down was pretty accurate to what that whole scenario was like. I mean, you could, you could criticize that it doesn't give enough perspective of the other side, but neither do most war movies, including private Ryan. So you know, there's a, there's a handful of others that I think do a good job of just getting the feel of it, which is very different from like, you know, most action movies and all that. Right. Yeah. And in, in those moments that you just outlined, those feel like little flourishes that you can expect in Spielbergian movies. Um, I, re I remember seeing little things that would be sort of um, little moments that was like in Gremlins uh, that sort of reminds me of Oh yeah, he takes his helmet off. It's like, oh, how lucky man and gets shot. Uh, these little quirky little things that Spielberg tends to throw in, and and while they're technically good, they're also kind of gimmicky in a way. Yeah. And so uh, yeah, it's it's a little. You kind of have to be in the mood for it, and and you can tell that he was doing like kids movies until Schindler's List and this, um, kind of leading up to it. So, but I think. I was reading some of the trivia on it and, you know, you watch it on Amazon and you can turn on the, the trivia stuff. And I think that was one of the things that, that they mentioned is that he wasn't sure how to approach this because he wanted to be very delicate with it, but also still inject a little bit of some humor, a little bit of realism. Um, Cause it's, it's a, it's something you don't want to like turn into like too comical. Uh, certainly, especially when a lot of those people were still alive. Um, as I guess that might be offensive to to do something like that with a it, with a historically sem somewhat accurate movie, you know, like this this was not this specific thing was an actual event, but D Day certainly was, and you know, a lot of the fighting that was going on in northern France and and wherever uh, those were actual things that happened. Though you know, this mission to save Private Ryan wasn't really a thing. It was sort of there were similar stories from like the civil war and, and maybe world war one that I was reading about. So it's not like this is the document documentary of this mission happening. It's sort of embellished a bit. Um, Robert, right. I know you want to jump in here. Well, I do. I just had a, a technical strategic tactic question. I don't know if CJ is able to answer this, but I'm curious because as they're invading Omaha beach, and you get these shots from the machine gun nests of the Germans and they're just, it's, 
shooting ducks. I mean, they're just fish in a barrel. They're just right there in front of them. They're just unloading these machine guns. And I'm thinking, is this before the use of smoke grenades? Like to cover your advance, you would, I mean, these days tactics, you throw in a, a smoke grenade, covers the advance of all these troops and they'd still be firing, but they'd be firing blindly into this wall of smoke. I'm sure there's, you know, wind is going to catch some and whatever. But I mean, if I was in charge of that invasion, I would be dumping all kinds of smoke right there in front of those machine gun nests to at least obscure the advancing troops. I, I don't know if, uh, you know, if that's accurate, if that's what really happened or, or what I know you probably don't want to just show a bunch of white smoke for a movie, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if they had the capability to, to dump enough of that stuff in the quantities and with the accuracy, you know, cause I'm, I'm assuming it would have to be like dropped by planes or something like that. Uh, and, and maybe the thinking was, well, if we're going to be doing that, why not have the planes actually like dive bombing, trying to, uh, drop dropping actual explosives mm -hmm. to try and take out some of those defenses rather than just trying to to screen the approach. I know that what ha what's shown in the in the film did happen in some instances where there were cases where they opened the doors on the landing craft too early for whatever reason they just you know mistook how how shallow they were, how close in they were. And so they open those front doors thinking that they're already like almost up on the beach. And then actually the water's still somewhat deep and you're still a distance away from the beach and you are sitting ducks. So that, that definitely did happen. And, you know, the, the film shows Omaha beach, which is one of the worst, if the, if not the worst of the uh, D-Day landing zones, there, there were several others and they, they weren't all Americans. There were also uh, British and Canadian soldiers involved in some of the other beaches and you know some of the the landing zones were more heavily defended than others some of them were were you know a, a much harder fight and whatever so this is showing like where it all was the worst i think it was the the landing zone where it was the slowest obviously they did eventually take the beach but it was actually like the slowest that they that they did it and and i think the heaviest losses too and the the Allies took proportionately heavy losses. I think they took like four times the losses that the Germans suffered in the actual initial, you know, fight mm -hmm. on the beaches. But that makes sense, right? Because when you're the attacker, you're always going to take way more, way more casualties than the defender. Right. And entrenched defenders, uh, I think it's like almost a 10 to one ratio, something yeah. like that. But yeah. And I, if I recall, you know, just from the very loose history I got in high school, so it's not very good, I'm sure, but that there was naval bombardment of the coastline um, prior to the landing as well. And it didn't seem to be evident so much in, in this, um, but I guess, you know, you kind of need the effect, right? So they wanted to have intact barracks or intact fortifications to be dealing with. Right. Yeah. And, and this film, I think, has been criticized a bit for kind of implying by omission that this was like all 100% an American operation and sort of leaving out the other allies who were involved. Mm. Now, I mean, I guess the flip side is you could say, well, we're telling a story about this one particular unit of Americans and they were at Omaha beach, which is mostly Americans doing the fighting there on the allied side. So, you know, but, but it's true that the version of, Amer of world war II that Americans typically are given explicitly or implicitly is that the U S basically did most of the work of fighting that war mm -hmm. and eh, sort of throw a little bit of token credit to the British for doing a little bit of help there too, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. And completely ignoring the fact that about 90% of the job of crushing the German army was actually done on the other front uh, mm -hmm. by the, by the commies, you know, it was actually the, the red army did about 90% of the work of grinding down the German war machine. Right, but they Western also allies. suffered significant losses too. Oh, like way more than astronomically. Yeah, astronomically. I for, I forget the the figures off the top of my head, but I I want to say that they lost. Um, I don't even know, twenty times, fifty times, some some ridiculous. I mean, because they lost millions and millions. Yeah, and uh, in the entire war, all theaters, the United States lost well under a million men. 
I, for, I forget the totals for World War II, but it was less than the Civil War. In the Civil War, the official American death count is usually given at something like seven or 800,000. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so World War II was less than that. So yeah, I mean, and, and you know, it wasn't really said in this movie, but it's it was said back in the History Channel, back when the History Channel used to just do World War II stuff nonstop. I remember those days. <laughs> yeah, they, they would basically almost say that like D-Day was the turning point of the war, either stating or implying that like the Nazis were on an unbroken winning streak until Team America showed up with a little bit of British help. Mm -hmm. And and not bothering to say that like, no, by 1944, in the east, the Germans had already been turned around by the Ruskies and, you know, at Stalingrad and a few other battles there, which were gigantic. I mean, battles that dwarf all the battles on the Western Front by orders of magnitude that that the Russians had already at great cost been pushing the Germans back for over a year on the other side when the Americans and British and Canadians hit them on the Western side. So, you know, it's it's not like like team america single-handedly rode in and saved the world or anything like that but We're, it it complicates the story right if you've got to say well actually a lot of the credit for beating the nazis goes to joseph stalin's army and that ruins the whole narrative a that america single-handedly saved the planet and well, you know all that stuff you hear about like well if it wasn't for d-day we'd still be we'd all be speaking german today and whatnot mm -hmm. like that you know and and it also muddies the waters of world war ii is a is a pure triumph of freedom and democracy and human rights over the forces of darkness because you know it's not at all what happened a lot of the the work of winning it was done by another brutal dictatorship you know and if you looked at world war ii from a from the perspective, it very much depends on what country you're looking at it from, whether it was a triumph of freedom and goodness or not. Because if you're looking at it from the perspective, say, of someone who's Polish, right? I mean, starts off, they get half their country steamrolled by the Germans and half by the Russians at the very beginning of the war, thanks to the Nazi-Soviet pact. Then the Germans steamroll across the whole thing when they, when they launch Operation Barbarossa, and they're brutally occupied by the Germans for all those years. And then when the Red Army comes back through steamrolling the other way, pushing the Germans back, they wreck the place again, and then you know put Poland under communism for the next 40-some-odd years. So you know, from the perspective of someone from Poland, it's like World War II wasn't a triumph of, of pure good over pure evil. It's... You know, they, they just got clobbered from all directions and then ended up under communism for almost 50 years. Yeah, it feels like that comic book version is just kind of the one that was sold to American school children. Um, sure. It, I guess, yeah. to you know, as a recruiting thing or something like well, that. And, and, and particularly those of Steven Spielberg's generation mm -hmm. who grew up in the aftermath of World War II when, when you know, a lot of the... the whitewashed version of the war was at its height. Like all the movies were about, you know, D-Day and, and all the uh, John Wayne stuff. Yeah. 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 All that, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's very cartoonish. And, 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 and then also because the cold war was already rolling by the time the baby boomers were growing up, then it was important to keep the, keep the propaganda about team America going strong for that. And, you could not acknowledge that it was actually the Russians that did most of the brutal job of beating the Nazi war machine right. for obvious reasons, right? It, it ruins the whole cold war narrative. Uh, if it's like, well, they actually did most of the work of taking out Hitler. So are a lot of these things sort of like introduced years later, years after the fact and sort of like altering the history a little bit. Um, Cause I'm curious if, if you know, cause I, I don't know, I only know what, you know, kind of the propaganda has been, but what was known about Hitler? Why w these soldiers going into this, did they, I don't think they knew about the concentration camps. I don't think they knew it was about uh, a Jewish thing, uh, which is what we hear now. Um, and just years previous to the war, Hitler was being praised as man of the year, turning around the economics of Germany. And, you know, he was looked upon very favorably uh, I think FDR said he admired him and, and vice versa. So it seems like what we're hearing now is sort of like after the fact alteration. And it's, I'd be curious to know what was the, at the time on the ground, what was the general understanding? 
Right, because what I understand is that maybe the governments were aware of the concentration camps and as they were turning bad and starting to kill all the people. But I don't, I, I'm, I'm curious as to the, like Daniel said, the, the word on the street, you know, what the common soldier knew. What was this information disseminated at the time? Or is it, yeah, rewriting history that all the invading troops would know all about the horrors of the concentration camps and yeah, not to put you on the righteous, spot. Taking out their righteous vengeance on the evil Germans. Right. Well, here, here's my, my overall sense of it, that there were some American progressives who said embarrassingly nice things about Hitler early on in his reign um, before things started to get really obviously dark. But by about the mid-1930s, so just a few years into Hitler's reign, FDR really was against him very early on in terms of his own kind of thinking and attitude. We now know that he had issues with Hitler going all the way back to the mid 1930s. And some of it was, may have been that FDR in part because of, of his experience in world war one, he wasn't a soldier, but he was at the Navy department during world war one under Woodrow Wilson. Um, that because he was like, part of running world war one that he had some some amount of just instinctive anti-german sort of feeling about him but that then what really started him to be against the nazi government when the things that were being done against the jews were just starting to roll out but they were still you know they were starting with the with the more kind of milder things like oh let's put them all in a ghetto oh let's make them all wear you know id patches and Oh, well, let's just keep them out of certain businesses and trades and professions and what, you know, bef before it's full on like death camps or whatever, when it's milder stuff. Um, that part of what miffed FDR about the Germans and the Japanese in the mid 30s was they were kind of trying to get in on some of America's trade action with places like Latin America. And so that really annoyed FDR you know, long before the Holocaust started when, when that stuff was still in the future. And then, you know, once Hitler starts invading various countries in Western Europe, that just, you know, makes him even more uh, FDR, even more anti, anti Hitler. But FDR would have known about the death camps very early on. The American people would not have been getting the full story yet. I don't think until, maybe near the end of the war. Hmm. Now, as far as like, you know, everybody, I'm sure there was some information getting in. Certainly a lot of Jewish Americans were, you know, in contact in some way with what was going on elsewhere in the world. And they probably were much more aware of, of how bad things were getting for the Jews over there than the average, you know, non-Jewish American. Um, the soldiers themselves, the common soldiers, they actually were shown propaganda films. There's the famous Frank Capra propaganda film series called Why We Fight that presents this very, very um, pure good versus pure evil narrative version of the war. That's If you watch it now, it's cartoonishly simplistic. But, you know, obviously, like there's clearly some truth to the fact that the German and Japanese and Italian governments were doing some bad stuff. Like there's no question about that. They weren't completely making that up, but that the version that they were getting, that the soldiers were being shown as to why we fight was as war propaganda always is just very, very one-sided and simplistic, but mm. it, it's been a while. I've actually watched a fair number of those why we fight films, but it's been a long time. I don't recall that they ever got into any detail about like actual death camps and, you know, Auschwitz and Dachau and places like that. But, um, you know, they, they, def the, they definitely for evil. Yeah. For and, evil, and just yeah. like, you know, Hitler's against freedom and he wants to take over the world. And one of the things that they, they often would harp on for their American, you know, military recruit audiences, if we don't go stop them, they're eventually coming here. You know, that was a big part of the version the U.S. government gave first to military recruits and then ultimately to the general public in their propaganda films was. And, and you could see how effective this was that people still repeat these 
these uh, cliches today, right? Of if we hadn't gone and fought the Nazis, they would have eventually taken us over and that kind of right. silly, silly stuff, which like, you know, the Nazis may have had all the bad intentions in the world to maybe eventually do that, but they, they were nowhere. They were, if anything, generations away from ever having logistical capabilities to do that. Considering the fact that at the time they never felt confident enough to try and pull off a cross channel invasion of great Britain. So yeah. If they didn't feel, yeah, exactly. A a piece of water that literally plenty of people have swum across successfully, right? That that they didn't feel they were capable. Now, if they had succeeded in holding Western Europe and Ukraine for like decades and decades and built up their, okay, maybe, you know, but now we're into the realm of like speculating, not just about alternate history, but about alternate history, then decades played out, which, okay, maybe, I don't know. Man in the high castle. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But you know, the the idea that like in 1946 they were coming for Team America if we didn't go beat them first is just it's it would be a logistical nightmare to invade yeah. that far across that much men and material, and then establishing beachheads and being able to funnel those oh, yeah. and that the shipping channels would just get obliterated. And it, yeah, it's yeah. And how how are they going to get across the Atlantic Ocean? without the British and American navies noticing and taking countermeasures, how are they going to get enough men and vehicles and whatever to North America? And then I don't know if you've ever driven across even just the lower 48. We have a very large country here. And And a lot uh, of people with guns. Yeah. And a lot of people with guns and it'd be, you know, red dawn, 1940 style, nonstop coast to coast. I mean, just look at the trouble team America has had trying to hold down Afghanistan for 20 years. Um, right. I mean, it's yeah. just insane. Like, how many million German soldiers would have to successfully make it to U.S. soil for them to have a prayer? Right. It's it's silly. But that was. And the yeah, so you're story. talking about a small country like Germany with how many millions of people? I mean, quite a few, but not nearly the manpower that the United States even had at the time. So, I, yeah. we would just overwhelm them. I, I would have to think at least. Yeah, but it seemed like they they definitely used the propaganda to their advantage. I mean, they were getting people to, you know, turn out the lights at night for fear of the Germans being right off the coast and potentially, you know, attacking the cities and things like that, like using that fear. And I think that they learned a lot of lessons from that. And then they used those things Uh, because you mentioned, you know, maybe the American people didn't know about the death camps and things like that at the time. And then we find out about it later. And and they were real things, but now it seems like recent wars are, they manufacture things to try to gin up the support and outrage for going to war, for doing these overseas uh, things. And and a lot of those things turn out to actually not have happened. Like I remember the uh, incubator babies um, from the Iraq thing was totally a a staged thing. And um, the Gulf of Tonkin has some issues there. Um, It seems like there's a lot of things that are just false flag operations to get people outraged just enough to support uh, these adventures overseas. Sure. Yeah. And the uh, Assad chemical weapons attacks that have been pretty decisively debunked at this point, as far as I've been able to tell. Every time they try Um, it too. (laughs) Yeah. 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 But you know, of course the, the story that Assad's gassing his own people that gets front page with a spotlight in bold font and then, you know, real experts actually doing real investigations and pretty conclusively showing it doesn't seem like that's what happened at all. Well, that only gets covered on the fringes of the alternative media. And mm-hmm. that's that, right? And so that way that the next time that they want to tell a story about somebody about to commit a genocide somewhere, um, you know, it, that's that's the playbook, right? It's always the, the playbook that that there's this evil madman who's about to do something terrible. And very often they they explicitly will link it back to World War II, even if it's a completely different situation, right? I mean, the next didn't, Hitler. Yeah, didn't didn't George H. W. Bush even compare Saddam Hussein to Hitler back in in the first Gulf War and that sort of thing? I mean, I believe he did, yeah. Which, which you know, okay, Saddam Hussein's a bad guy. I, I don't want to live under under his regime, but to to compare him with Hitler is like an insult to the millions upon millions of people that were killed by Hitler. And, you know, uh, there's a huge difference between, between, you know, a kind of typical crummy oppressive dictator in a third world country versus a much more aggressive regime in command of like probably the number two industrial country in the world at the time, Germany. Uh, That that's, that's, not even comparable in terms of capabilities, right? To Iraq. 
Yeah, I right. think it really says something to the psychology of the average person, though, that Hitler is the great evil because I guess he killed people that weren't Germans. I mean, he killed Germans too, of course, Jews and whatever, but gypsies and homosexuals and stuff like that. But then he also killed other people. I don't know. Uh, Stalin doesn't seem to get the same treatment because he only murdered mostly his own people. And then Mao, even though he murdered many, many more times people than Hitler, right. it's just. It seems like a strange thing for people to just not even remember that the communists have killed way, way more. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, part of it might be chalked up to the fact that, that they were in power a lot longer in their respective countries and they had bigger populations to work with as far as democide and all that. So, you know, had Hitler had a bigger country and or multiple more decades in power, he might have equaled them. Who knows? But yeah, it, it is, you know, interesting to notice the difference of treatment, right? That, that at least some on the, even in the kind of mainstream left, let alone the actual like Bolsheviks and whatever will go into apologetics, gymnastics mode for somebody like Mao, right? Uh, well, he meant killing, well. <laughs> yeah. For killing tens of millions of people. They're like, well, it was an accident. He was an agrarian reformer who, you know, had some good ideas, but some of them got a little out of hand. He took a couple things a little too far. What are you going to do? You know, but you got to break they, some eggs to make a great society. Come yeah. On. Yeah. They, they never pull out those sorts of justifications for Hitler for some reason. You know? Um, yeah. I mean, the ultimate thing is, is they're both using violence to achieve their ends. I don't know the the real difference there. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm generally opposed to mass murder, regardless of what you know, supposed endpoint utopia it's in in the furtherance of. But I guess I'm kind of weird in that I'm consistent that way, weird. right? Or or which weapon they chose to use, whether it be uh, gas chambers, bullets, or uh, starvation, which yeah. was the the Ukraine um, the Holmador, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I would like to go back to the um, why we fight. You mentioned that um, mm -hmm. my favorite piece of World War II media, Band of Brothers, had an episode called Why We Fight. And it was the episode, as you would expect, where they find the, the, the Dachau and concentration camps. And they, I, I, I'm testing my memory here, but it seems to me that those soldiers in the show, as they're depicted, and I know Tom Hanks is involved in that movie too, or that series also, but um, they seemed surprised when they came across those those camps and like they were just horrified by what they saw. Now, I think you would be horrified even if you knew of them, like yeah, we're going to find these concentration camps. But seeing them is a whole other thing. They're like, oh, my God, look at these people. These are skeletons walking around. But it, it seemed in the show like they were didn't have any idea that they were there and they just kind of stumbled across them. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit to the accuracy of that if you are aware of it? Yeah, I, I've actually never never watched that show, so um, oh, okay. I, I, I don't know the exact <laughs> scene you're 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 uh, referring to, but my my sense of it is that it it's probably likely that common soldiers might very well have not had a sense of of exactly what was going on and whether or not they knew about about these camps you know did they understand how horrific the conditions were how people were just being you know systematically murdered in in many of them i i think it's likely they probably didn't they they might have had some sense of concentration camps but thought of them more in the sense of like uh the concentration camps that the US government had deployed against filipino populations during the Filipino quote unquote insurrection or that the Spanish had had been using in Cuba uh, before the Spanish American war or that the, uh, the British used in the Boer war, those sorts of things where, where you're putting people in prison camps because you suspect them of disloyalty or supporting insurgents. You're not deliberately trying to gas them or even deliberately try to starve them, but you're putting them into terrible condition makeshift prisons where inevitably because of malnourishment and disease and lack of sanitation or whatever, a bunch of people are going to die. So I don't know if I, if I had to guess, I would say that maybe some of the U S soldiers had some sense that people were, were being held in prison camps or whatever. Maybe not even all of them 
quite knew that, but that they probably most of them would have would have been very surprised by how horrific it was when they saw it. I think I remember reading that even a lot of the American generals were taken aback when they actually got like Eisenhower and guys like that, that, and for somebody like Eisenhower to be somewhat knocked off balance and caught off guard indicates to me, either he had little idea this was happening or he had, again, a sense that there were sort of prison camps and it was bad, but not, you know, it, we have a tendency today to, because we know the, we know the whole story, you know, from all sides. So we kind of can retroactively map backwards, right, into the minds of, say, the American soldiers and go, oh, they must have known that, you know, six million Jews or whatever were getting killed and how, how terrible it was and whatever. But not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, they, they got the Why We Fight videos basically being like, yeah, Hitler's mean. He doesn't like freedom and he's going to come, you know, take <laughs> us over. And, no. Yeah. No. In today's day and age, I tend to think that hey, everybody's got a cell phone. This kind of thing would be exposed and be on the internet like right away. But aren't there like I mean, Guantanamo still exists. There are black sites around the world. But aren't there like I keep hearing these concentration camps in China about the Folong Gong. Is that? Do you know anything about that? I mean, I know I'm leading way off the way of the movie here, <laughs> but. Same Private Ryan, right? <laughs> Same Private Ryan, but I mean, yeah. concentration camps kind of like kind of tangentially related. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sure the the communist Chinese government has all kinds of you know nefarious stuff going on that we don't always have the full story on. Um, one that we do have a little bit more of an understanding of, I think, is North Korea, right? Which is the we we'll talk about just you know over the top insane cartoonish levels of, of evil and oppression. And, you know, they're, they're still doing old school, right? Old school, uh, concentration camps, you know, gulags, but way worse from everything I've heard. So, mm. yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the Chinese government is they're they're as oppressive as they can sort of get away with while still, being somewhat economically plugged into the global trading system. And, you know, I don't think the Chinese regime wants to be as oppressive as North Korea because they can see what, you know, like how it makes North Korea so poor and isolated. And I don't think the communist Chinese government wants to be that, you know, economically backward and impoverished and whatever like that. Maybe because at the end of the day, the it's, yeah, it's tough for them, right? I mean, if you're if you're a tax farmer, you don't want your tax livestock to be too, you know, malnourished and unhealthy or whatever, because then there's there's less wealth for you to skim and exploit and what have you. You need that golden goose. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the North Korean regime is just all in on it, right? They're <laughs> they're uh, just they say that they a spiraling down, and there's no level they won't go to. I don't know. It's just yeah. seems strange that you would think that they would ha allow them at least some level of freedom. But yeah, they're what, like less than, I think their GDP was like 33 billion or something like that. Like just nothing for the entire country. And then South Korea's is like 10 times that or 20 times that. I don't know. It's whatever right. it is. Yeah. Well, let's bring this back to Saving Private Ryan just a little bit. <laughs> um, what? I know, right? So speaking of, the frame of reference and, and the fog of war, I think you made a good point, CJ, is like people aren't going to know all the information that we now have in retrospect. But we also have the propaganda that's, that's come out as well that, you know, who knows what's actually what happened versus what we've been told what has happened. But in this movie, it seems like there's definitely a streak of it's known that something's happening to the Jews because Mellish is like, look, Judah, Judah, you know, like right. to the line of the Germans going by. And I know Spielberg right before this had made Schindler's List. So I'm sure in a way you can kind of connect the two a little bit and kind of imbibe that, uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a messaging going on here that, that maybe these characters do know uh, more than they probably would in, in reality. Well, he, he is a character might because he was, you know, he's a Jewish character, right? So mm -hmm. he probably would have been following events in Germany 
for longer and more closely, I would guess, than would the other, you know, Gentile uh, soldiers. So I didn't necessarily have a problem with him being more aware and, and more focused on that than the rest of the soldiers. Like, I think the rest of the soldiers, they had, a, they definitely had a sense as most Americans did by then that, yeah, the, the Nazis really don't like Jews and they're doing some bad stuff to them and what have you. But I think, I don't know, it does make sense to me that a Jewish soldier, even at that time would have been much more plugged into it. I don't know that, 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 that didn't, I don't know. That didn't strike me as as implausible. Yeah, this seems a little more obviously historically accurate than say what that Tarantino movie. What's the name of that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the Inglorious Bastards, where there's yeah, Brad Pitt's going around. Yeah, going around. Yeah, just in yeah. vengeance of yeah. Because anyway. I, I I think in general from what I've read and what I know that that definitely. Uh, Jewish Americans were way more paying attention to this the whole time than, you know, everybody else in America. Right. And I know people were fleeing Germany. Jewish people were fleeing. Mises fled, right. uh, went to Switzerland, and then it ended up in the U.S., I think, in 44, 45, something like that. Euro Human Action, 49. Hmm. But yeah, so so it must have been getting out that, you know, people are leaving and they're leaving for a reason. Right. Yeah, and you know that's another thing that only started to really get looked at um, maybe the last few decades is just how much the British and American governments didn't help Jews earlier on, both before the war and in the early stages of the war, when there were opportunities to do so. Like, for example, you know, how... Yeah, there's there's a handful of Jewish refugees who are famous that we know who make it out, right? Um, Mises, Hayek, Albert Einstein, you know, th there there are these these individuals, but th and there the were large guys. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> later, um, <laughs> but but they were on the other side. Uh, but that there were there were large numbers of Jews from Germany and then from some of the other places when Germany took them over who tried to get out, some of whom were able to get out. Like there were cases where, you know, a boatload of Jewish refugees shows up trying to get into the U S or trying to get into the UK or trying to get into um, Palestine, which at the time the British controlled as part of their empire. And they were turned away. They were not allowed in as refugees. They were, you know, sent back or what have you. Hmm. And, and so, and they're, Early on, it seems that the initial idea of the Nazi regime, they didn't really start like the systematic final solution until I think 1941 or 42 or something like that. You know, they had the prison, the prison camps and, and bad stuff going on, but they didn't full on go, all right, let's do genocide until partway through the war. And their initial idea seems to have been, let's just deport all these people. Let's just, you know like ethnically cleanse them by just kicking them out of, out of German territory rather than by killing them. And then the British and American and some of the other governments were only willing to take in very small numbers of, of refugees. Mm. And so th this is a, this is a thorny question of, do you bear any responsibility? Yeah. You didn't, you didn't, you know, if you meaning the American and British governments and whatever, um, there was even a conference before the war, I think in France, I'm blanking on the name of it. There was a conference where I think the Nazis were just trying to like kick all their Jews out. And the Western allies at that time, France hadn't been you know, conquered by Germany yet that they, that they were basically like, no, we're not taking them. So, hmm. you know, I mean, that's not the same thing as doing the genocide, but at the very least, I think we could call that kind of a dick move. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And there's an escalation like, well, they're going to do something else, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if I don't know, if someone's drowning, and you do have the ability to save them, and you're like, well, you know, it's kind of inconvenient, so no. Yeah. Like, okay, you didn't drown them, but you're not necessarily the good guy, like through and through here. Yeah, it's like the end of Seinfeld. Yeah. The good Samaritan law. Exactly. <laughs> I can't believe I'm laughing about this, but um, yeah. Uh, so I think we've, we've 
kind of gone um, almost the length of this show already. And I feel like there's so much more to talk about. Uh, so are there any final notes, Robert, um, that you want to just make sure we mention during the show before we get into final summary and review? Well, I just have a note here that, you know, defending our country in a foreign land, we've already talked about that, but that is the, the propaganda that you have to go over there, fight them over there so they won't fight them over here. They say that about every stinking war. Um, either it's the domino theory of communist countries in Asia or uh, Iraq and terrorism and that sort of thing. So, you know, you don't, uh, what, what do you want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud? I mean, there's all kinds of different propaganda, but it, and then you, then you, then the soldiers come home and you celebrate them and say that they're defending our freedom over there. And it's like, okay, I don't know how my freedom got over there. I don't know how my freedom, my freedom seems to be in bigger danger over here from the people over here, the thugs that are in charge over here, not from some thugs that are in charge over there. As bad as those may be, they're still not necessarily my business. So I don't know. That's, no, that's a, that's a very good point. And I think it holds true to this day. Um, and, and, you know, back to the whole idea of they, uh, will often try to keep people um, in fear of something happening, uh, even if they have to manufacture it to kind of maintain control and legitimacy uh, and support for their, uh, you know, aggressions overseas. And uh, as we all know, to prosecute a war overseas, you have to kind of be at war with your own people to extract those resources uh, and extract those people, those human people to, to go and do these, uh, these things uh, based on, you know, orders and chain of command. Yeah, and they really demonize. I don't know. Some of the history I've heard was back when, back before World War One, the United States was really a kind of isolationist country, and they, a lot of the propaganda at the time was just that how terrible that was because there's all these evil things happening, and how dare America just sit back and not do anything to help? And yeah, it wasn't the great the uh, opposite of that. Uh, we're wasn't it the dig against the uh, Neville Chamberlain? Um, because he could have prevented uh, Hitler's rise to power or something along those lines or, or st stood up to him earlier. Well, it's the Treaty of Versailles that created Hitler. And, yeah, you know, yeah, you're not supposed that. to, you're not supposed to connect the dots there, Robert. It's, it's, it's all the economic sanctions from World War I <laughs> that totally destroyed the economy of Germany that created a, a people hungry for change enough to get this crazy strongman in power. I mean, they're crazy strong in power all over the planet, but I mean, I, I really don't think you have World War One without World War Two, Treaty of Versailles. Right, right. Well, um, you know, I hate to say it, but, but we are uh, close to the end here. So if we could, uh, well, CJ, I'll, I'll, I'll let you say any final words before um, your final summary review. Actually, I'll, I'll go to you for anything you want to say. And then we'll have Robert do final summary review and a score so that you kind of get a flavor of how that works. And then I'll do mine. And then uh, we'll have a little Kathleen Turner overdrive after this for our Patreon supporters. So everyone who supports us on Patreon, we do appreciate you. I'll actually roll your names now. Um, and if you'd like to get your name down on this list, uh, hit us up at lastmanagers.com slash Patreon and uh, send us some money. And we'll send you some bonus content and a whole bunch of other good stuff. But uh, you have the floor, CJ. Sure. Well, it's really important when you look at the overall patterns of the subjects of war movies and what wars are they showing and how are they depicting them that you had this brief window of time in the seventies and into the eighties where there were a fair number of Vietnam movies. And a lot of them were clearly intended to be anti-war and critical of the Vietnam war and all that stuff. Right. And then by the time you get into the nineties, when we're trying to kick the Vietnam syndrome and get more active in, in the middle East and elsewhere, all of a sudden there starts to be this giant rash of big budget world war two movies. And suddenly there's no more Vietnam war movies at all. And it's all world war two movies. Right. And then look at even since then, since private Ryan 20 some odd years ago, there have been a handful of movies related to the, you know, Iraq war and Afghanistan war and whatever, but not many really. Hmm. And very, very little in the way of Vietnam war movies anymore. And world war two movies, they just keep ranking them out. Right. And it shows you how much the mythological version of this war is one of the biggest centerpieces of the American self myth, myth, 
uh, mythology today that it it really is what they justify every new intervention on to some degree is world war ii and you know living up to the legacy of the greatest generation and all that and i don't know if you guys had seen this anywhere um but spielberg the year after private ryan in 1999 spielberg was awarded the department of defense medal for distinguished distinguished public service mm. by secretary of defense william cohen in recognition of the film saving private ryan this award is the highest award the defense department issues to people who are not military okay so the pentagon gave him a super duper duper award for making this film what does that tell you yeah about what's really going on here. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. And I, I remember some of the uh, 80s war movies were almost propaganda uh, recruiting tools like Top Gun and uh, maybe a few others, like some of the Chuck Norris ones. Those, those weren't nearly as um, impactful or famous. But right. yeah, it seemed to turn the corner with Saving Private Ryan. And you're right, there's been a slew of World War II movies ever since. And a huge percentage of the Hollywood, especially if it's a big budget Hollywood war movie, a huge percentage of them have military involvement in their production in various ways. And mm -hmm. then have, um, you know, the military has, has even the right to uh, rewrite scripts. In some cases, we know they've done this. Uh, one, one movie that was somewhat rewritten by the Pentagon in return for getting Pentagon support for production was actually Iron Man that Iron Man's original script apparently was much more anti-military industrial complex. Mm. And they wanted military, they wanted military support to be able to do things like film on a military base and have fighter jets in the background or whatever. And the Pentagon said, well, you got to change these parts of the script over here if you want to be able to do this. And they said, okay, you know, and um, that's just one example. But yeah, a lot of times if you're seeing a movie, a big budget Hollywood movie that deals with war or that deals with the CIA, or that deals with the FBI, there is a pretty high chance that people from those institutions were involved in its production to some degree. So, so there, you're seeing what they want you to see. Top, yeah, Top Gun is to a large extent a commercial for the Navy. Yeah, I think I saw a Facebook post you had made uh, about a limited hangout. Yep. So that's kind of the concept where they they expose some real information, but it's just enough to like make you feel satisfied that you know something about it, but that you're not going to dig too much further, right? Something like that. Yeah. That's, that's pretty common with movies that deal with the CIA that are, you know, to some degree based on true stories like uh, the, um, what was it? American made with mm -hmm. Tom Cruise that like yeah. gives you part of the Barry seal story, but not, not the, all of it, you know, not the Bill Clinton part. part. <laughs> yeah. Well, they actually do have a, have a brief scene where they, where they do kind of at the end there a little tie bit, that yeah. in a little bit. Yeah. Um, but you know, they, they never, they never quite give you all of the dirty laundry and the Epstein series on Netflix, I think was what I was referring to most recently where, right. you know, it, it, it gives you enough that, that if you're a normie, you go, Oh man, I know the inside scoop. I'm, I'm part of the, uh, you know, the, I took the red pill. I see the matrix now, <laughs> but if you've actually been following the real whole story in, in real honest media outlets, you go, they didn't quite go all the way down the rabbit hole on purpose. Right. Yeah. This talk reminds me of uh, Michael Bay. I uh, supposedly he had a bunch of access to the military generals oh. and whatnot and let him use film on battleships and use yeah. military equipment. And I'm sure they had some kind of level of script approval in order to uh, allow all that. Yeah, no question. He's been one of their famous and most, you know, biggest and most frequent collaborators for the last 20 years. I mean, the Pentagon is like involved with the Transformers movies. And I mean, it's not always stuff that you would even expect. It's it's sometimes stuff where the military only plays like a little side role or something like that. But they still, you know, get their get their claws in. And then it basically amounts to it. It adds so much production value if you know, your movie deals with war, the military, and you're actually able to film on bases and have military hardware floating around in the background and have even in some cases soldiers as extras, you know, running around and whatever. It's like, if you had to do that all on your own, 
logistically and whatever the budget would balloon and yeah, and, yeah. and they absolutely. say that they they say that they charge the film production companies like to reimburse for the cost of all that stuff but a there's evidence to suggest that that's not really the case and b how would you even know like what the market rate is to to <laughs> rent a military base right. and what, it's like who knows you're you're no longer in a in a in a rational um market feedback sort of situation like who knows you know just make stuff up right this is this is the same institution that you know famously do, does the hundred thousand dollar toilet seats and all that you know yeah, the twelve thousand dollar hammers yeah 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 and and uh robert higgs has really great stuff especially related to world war ii uh, he's got some lectures and he talks about how um you know the gdp numbers are totally including all the spending that's done by the military and that there's no rational economic calculation. So they can't possibly know what these things actually represent. And so he likes to talk about how, well, you really need to talk about what's going to consumers and that's what you have to count as, you know, productive uh, and value being provided. So I'll post some of those uh, lectures down below and also a series that the Mises Institute did something like 20 years ago or 25 years ago now, uh, called the costs of war and the uh, great john v denson murray rothbard and a few others uh, give presentations and talks and they talk about uh the two good wars or two just wars and i'll uh, just spoiler alert world war ii ain't one of them so <laughs> uh and and they talk to that a little bit so um i'll have that on our show notes page at slash 127 uh but why don't we go over to final summary and review and i'll go to you robert to uh kick it off all right well if you've listened to the show before almost every time we do a war movie i do some version of this speech so if you've heard it before i apologize but uh this is what occurs to me to say right now so war is a giant government project and it's oh, st state apologists like to point to giant government projects that happen and it's like the only way we could do that so you got to have a government in order to achieve these great things because people individually aren't going to do this thing and you know killing hitler is one of them like a bunch if, if the united states wasn't you know a military power we wouldn't have gone over there and we wouldn't have killed them and then we'd all be speaking german like we said but they like to point to these few positive things and it's debatable whether it's positive, but I'll give you killing Hitler as a good idea. Um, as you know, examples of why we got to have a government, but they it's a real case of seen versus the unseen. The man loss, the equipment loss, the time loss, the money loss that happens in a war is massively economically destructive. It's in terms of human loss, of course, also. But think of all of those people that died and all the good, great economic things they could have gone on to do. They could have invented the cure for cancer. You don't know. So all those people that died would have gone on to do any number of positive things. I mean, maybe there's a few negative things, but almost ultimately it would have been a great thing. And then the misplaced allocation of resources, all the money that was spent in the war effort to make tanks and bombs and planes and all that kind of thing would have gone to instead people trying to service each other's needs in the marketplace and making your life better and improving your situation and your friend's situation and the situation of your loved ones. So it's just this massive case of the seen versus the unseen. And every time someone justifies a war, you just got to think of, well, government just misallocates resources all the time what makes you think this is the right way to do it now like with um with corona and them you know using force to tell everybody that they have to stay home well what happens when they're wrong what happens if the war is wrong i mean they can't possibly know the best way to spend everybody else's money so anyway um that's just my little rant on the war but the movie itself is, is, is quite entertaining. It's it's very a patriotic movie, like you say. I mean, we, we said in, in, the, in the show, it could either be used as an anti-war film or a pro-war film. I tend to lean on this movie being a very pro-war film, even though it does show some serious psychological effects on the soldiers. But um, 
yeah, it's uh, it's still a good movie. I mean, Spielberg, this is at the height of his powers. This is, you know, directed fantastically. And yes, he does kind of come from this kind of tongue in cheek, kind of corny kind of style. He's got a little, these little funny flourishes. So there's a little bit of that, but for the most part, this is a very serious film. It's not quite as serious as like Schindler's List, but this is like a very entertaining, crowd pleasing type movie, especially if you're in the United States. Um, unless you're maybe particularly of my persuasion, anti-war persuasion, but um, I, I I don't know exactly how I'm going to rate this. Uh, it's it's well acted. There's all kinds of like very famous actors that were not necessarily so well known at the time, but have since gone on to do all kinds of stuff. Um, there's nothing that really stands out that's bad, but other than the the slight little the ambiguous moral elements that we were talking about earlier in the show. I'm going to have to say that this is like a 7.5. I'm just going to bail and say it's, it's just generally good, but I, I'm not going to say it's amazing and it's not obviously not bad. So, All right. Well, how very pussy of you, Robert. It's <laughs> been my manhood. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, we were doing uh, some questioning of my manhood during the pre-show, so it's only turnabout's fair play here. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll just say that I think that this movie technically is very, very well done. Spielberg is uh, obviously a master of his craft, though you can definitely tell that it is Spielberg, uh, especially when paired with Williams' score and a lot of the um, audio work, the Foley work and, and, you know, the constant machine gunning and things like that. Like there's a there's an audio experience uh, when you're watching this movie. So if you can get the version with the Atmos uh, where they bounce the sound off the ceiling. Uh, you're, it feels like or sounds like bullets are going by your head uh, during the Omaha Beach scene. It's kind of surreal. Uh, my wife and I were watching it downstairs while the girls were upstairs playing on their Kindles, and they knew it was something they shouldn't be watching. And uh, it's, that's definitely, uh, definitely an, an accurate statement. I wouldn't want my kids watching this until they're much, much, much older. But uh, like I said, technically, this is a very good film, and uh, I think it kind of does have a muddied and, and ambiguous moral message. It's it's almost like the lesson is uh, don't do the right thing because it might come and bite you in the ass. Um, but it also does feel like it is fairly pro, uh, pro-military, pro, you know, this is the good war. This is very patriotic. This is something that should be celebrated and these people should be revered. Um, I think that you know, most of the time people are, who are going and actually fighting these wars, they're probably doing it for good reasons or the right reasons, but they're being lied to most of the time. Uh, and uh, they probably have more in common with the soldier they're shooting at than the person giving them the order to do that. So it's it's kind of a sad thing to see. And uh, unfortunately, we have lots of war in the world and um, uh, it gets celebrated. Like we were saying, you know, these types of movies get made with military input. Uh, and, and there's certainly a purpose behind that. But in general, it's it's a it's a well done movie. Um, I think it's worth watching. And so in my also uh, unsatisfactory answer, <clears throat> I'll give this a tepid black and gold uh, rating, which is my sort of like partial thumbs up. Um, the alternative is black and red, which is the thumbs down. So that's my rating for this. I'm not going to give it a number. Uh, so CJ, we'll go to you for your uh, final comments and a score, and then we'll get into some Kathleen Turner overdrive after this. Yeah, I, I also find this one hard to rate overall, as we've been saying all along, you know, from a technical filmmaking standpoint, it's very good. The acting is mostly very good. And, you know, just as an experiential depiction of, of what these sorts of battles and campaigns probably would have looked and felt like and what have you. It's probably the best cinematic depiction of the Western front in world war II, at least that I'm aware of. There's the, the, the issue of some of the lack of clarity about what's really the, the larger meaning here. And uh, some people that I seen who've criticized the movie a little bit have said that the intro and outro segment where we see old private Ryan, you know, grandpa, private Ryan 
that feels kind of out of step with the rest of the movie, not just in terms of time period, that, that it just, in terms of tone and message, it doesn't quite fit with a movie that otherwise is at least somewhat ambiguous about the issues related to war and that the intro and the outro where old private Ryan is going to the cemetery, the military cemetery in Normandy and all that feels more like something from out of a much more simplistic, almost like Michael Bay type movie where it's, it's very simplistic and kind of tear jerky and pulling at your heartstrings. And in, in a way that the rest of the movie doesn't ever quite do that, that garishly, that, that crudely. So the, I'll, I'll say that too. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would have to give it, a, I don't know, a, a low B from putting all this together in that in all the technical aspects, it's, it's very good that, I don't know, a guy getting a super duper prestigious award from the Pentagon for making a war movie that, I don't know, that, that just knocks some of the wind out of my sails on that. So I'd, I'd give it, I don't know, eight out of 10 something like that. Oh, I was all excited about you giving a, a third uh, grading scale. Yeah, I like the B minus idea. That's uh, yeah. perfect. It's the Entertainment Weekly style, I think. Uh, we could have gone stars as well. So a lot of... Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll knock it down a letter grader too, just because of the Pentagon Award. That that just... I, I can't let that slide. Right. And, and it is appropriate for there. you being a professor. That's right. Giving it's it just... a letter grade. The, this is where my mind goes whenever I'm rating things. I'm always like, uh, I'd give that a C minus, you know, something like that. All right. Well, uh, thanks again, uh, Prof. CJ, for joining us for this. I hope you can stick around for a little bit longer. We have a little bit more content uh, for some of our Patreon people. So lastnaps.com slash Patreon, everybody, to get some of the extra bonus content. And do check out the Dangerous History Podcast at profcj.org or dangerousshistorypodcast.com. Is that correct? Yep. Either of those will take you to my homepage. All right, perfect. And uh, he's got lots of great stuff, over 200 episodes. And uh, I will have a link to that on our show notes page at lastnarrative.com slash 127. We'll also have some of the other notes we've talked about, including the Cost of War series, uh, Prof. CJ's um, appearance on the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus's podcast that was recently done, and uh, any other good stuff I can think of to to toss your guys' way. So um, anyway, we will say uh, thank you for being our guest. And uh, Robert, how can people support the show after I tell you what we're going to do next? Because I, I always forget that part. We're going to be doing a Superman movie set in Russia. What if he didn't land in an island? What if he landed in the Ukraine, perhaps? So Superman Red Sun will be uh, the next item up for bid on the uh, podcast here. And we will have a returning guest, Shaheen, who is uh, our guest for all things DC related. So that should be a lot of fun. So Robert, how can people support what we do here? Well, I'm excited about Red Sun. Let me just say, I, I watched that movie a few weeks back. Well, it's probably a few months ago now and just thought it was perfect for the show. I mean, it's just full on talking about communism versus capitalism and all kinds of comments that are gonna be fun to talk about. So. If you liked what you heard today, if you want to hear some more, then uh, yeah, support the show if you can. Go to Trevster.com, purchase some of my silly artworks that maybe support some of the things you may believe. You can uh, also leave comments, talk to your friends about it. You can leave likes, you can subscribe. You can support us on Patreon, any dollar amount you desire. I think the minimum is a dollar a month. Is that right, Daniel? I think so, yeah. So it's uh, not too difficult to do. Actually, I upgraded it. It's three dollars is the minimum. But oh, Daniel! To get anything. Oh, Daniel! I know. Well, you can still give us something, right? You can just like give us like twenty five cents. Is that the minimum Patreon you can do? A penny? Or something. It, it's got to be something. And now they're taxing it, by the way. Well, good. They're taxing uh, Patreon payments, like to the Patreon person. Like if if I Robert Patreonized you, mm -hmm. then I would pay tax on my donation to you. Like well, I'm sure the government facilitated something, right? I mean, they deserve it. They, you didn't build that. That's right. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll we'll diverge from uh, from this conversation and get into some Kathleen Turner overdrive uh, right after I say, um, what's the thing I say? Oh yes, good night from last night, don't you? I do. Good night from last night, everyone. <laughs>